Thank you, Garrett, and thank you, uh, Bill, for inviting me here. This is, in fact, my first attendance. So I, um, I've, I've had some troubles in my field, I, I must say, but uh, now when I go home and tell people I've come to a conference like this, <laughs> I don't know what people will say next. Um, yes, I, I've actually got 40 minutes, I think, to, to uh, condense from 40 hours of seminar, which in turn represents more than 40 years of work, which represents, I, I think, about 4,000 years worth of observations by others. It goes back that far. Uh, so we'll see what we can do. I can just say some provocative things and leave it at that. We can talk about, you know, explanations a little bit later on. Um, I, uh, the the 4,000 year reference that I'm making is, of course, we are what we eat. That goes back at least 4,000 years, to my knowledge, the best I can figure out. This is the book to which uh, Garrett uh, uh, identified. And obviously, I can't give all the explanations of why I'm going to say the things we're going to say, so I suggest if you're interested, you can, uh, you can get that book. Um, this started uh, quite a many, number of years ago, uh, when in fact, I actually took a faculty position at Virginia Tech just down the road uh, in the Department of Biochemistry. And I had at that time a responsibility to help organize and coordinate a program in the Philippines uh, with State Department funding uh, to try to help bring under control uh, malnutrition in children, of which, of course, this is a, an unfortunate consequence. And at that time, without getting into a lot of other detail, uh, it, it was an opportunity for, well, I went there with my senior colleague to make sure that these children got enough protein. I mean, that's what we tend to think about in Western societies, as far as our own diet is concerned, make sure we get enough protein. You've heard the story, I'm sure, whether you've been in the science or not. And so this is what this study was in part about was to try to figure out, make sure these kids got enough protein. And that suited my kind of thinking, as it did my senior colleague, uh, because that's what we tend to think in science, and nutrition in particular. Um, and along the way, again, without getting into all the details, uh, I got the impression, uh, in talking to some people, and considering the question concerning cancer formation especially, which was my special interest at the time, uh, was that cancer tended to be more common in families, and even in children, uh, and families who are consuming the levels of protein, like we do. In other words, higher levels. We, we as a society tend to consume very high levels of protein uh, here. Uh, there, they don't. Uh, but the few families who did seem to have had children and themselves who had higher levels of a certain kind of cancer, it was liver cancer in particular. Um, and so it was odd. We're going there to increase protein intake to bring it up to our level, when in fact, it might have that kind of consequence. So this study came out from India, uh, using experimental animals, showing that, in fact, uh, animals that, given regular levels of protein, that's 20% of total calories, the way we express it, compared to animals given lower levels, and all animals exposed to a very potent chemical carcinogen, by the way, that the animals given the uh, regular levels of protein, uh, which were thought by the investigators to actually maybe repress and keep under control the formation of this cancer. In fact, they were the ones that got all the cancer, as opposed to the ones given lower levels of protein, which get, got none. And we did, they didn't need a statistician to tell them whether or not that was significant, uh, because it was quite clear. Um, it, it was also coincided with what, in fact, I said that I thought I saw in the children and the families, uh, getting more protein, getting more cancer. I mean, that's pretty odd. Um, and. Um, so we went on. I, I, I took this observation, or those observations, and then organized a study with NIH funding, which continued over the next 27 years with one major grant. Uh, so this, this, what I'm going to tell you, now it was funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, and in fact was published in, in the best journals that we, we have in our field. So I'm just going to just mention some things, because with that start, that focus on a rather narrow question, actually has now expanded, <laughs> for me at least, it's a very broad perspective of what health and nutrition is all about. And I just want to share this with you because these are, this in the next couple of slides is what really just provoked, my, I guess, my thinking more than anything. Namely, if you take animals and you expose them to a very potent chemical carcinogen in this particular case, causing liver cancer, uh, but then subsequently uh, give them either uh, one of two levels of protein, either the good levels or the lower levels, if you will, uh, this early cancer begins to form over the first 12 weeks, uh, you know, rather 
well when these animals are given the so-called recommended good levels of protein. In contrast, the animals given the lower levels, like the Indian workers had found, uh, did not get cancer. Uh, but then uh, we, we sort of turned our attention a little bit to um, uh, the next question, and that was, what happens during this period, let's say, when you switch protein back and forth uh, during this early stage? And uh, what we found, of course, as you can see here, you feed animals 20% in the first three weeks, these cancers are growing rather well. Early cancers, I should say, these are pre-neoplastic, so to speak, or lesions that we could identify. Yeah, and then you switch them to the 5%, you turn it off, turn it back on, turn it off. In other words, in doing this in many different ways, yeah. this is just one illustration, uh, we could actually turn on and turn off this experimental cancer development simply by fairly modest nutritional means, just, just trading uh, the protein back and forth. Um, but then I got, let me just take a diversion on the side a bit. I don't want to say, you know, that protein is bad. It's not. I mean, no, protein is an essential nutrient. The question is how much. And so we were able to examine that question to some extent in this, in this experimental animal system by basically uh, feeding from 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, on up to 20% protein to see what the dose response relationship is all about. And what we learned in this particular case here was that uh, up to about 10%, protein, which is the amount needed for growth, it's actually, 10% is an excess of what these animals actually need, uh, but it's, it's, it's a generous and decent level. Uh, every, the, the, the cancer didn't grow, in spite of the fact that these animals had been exposed to a chemical carcinogen. It was only when in excess these cancers really took off. And if we want to try to, you know, sort of ask ourselves, is this equivalent to humans in any way? It turns out the amount of protein we humans need compared to animals is about the same. There's a, there's a slight difference. But I'm here talking about the shape of this curve more than the actual identity of the quantity. In any case, it turns out that when these animals are fed protein in excess, they get this. The human range of consumption is somewhere between about 11 and 22 percent. So the extent to which, if you make the assumption, radical assumption perhaps, but if you make the assumption that we as humans uh, are more or less requiring the same amount of protein, and in fact, we're consuming levels of protein amongst all of us, 95% of us, in that range where cancer might form, uh, this certainly provokes a question as to whether or not I think this is relevant for humans. Um, but that was, these were early cancers. So we, then we did the sort of, in, in cancer research, we want to know what happens over a lifetime because cancer takes a long time to form, as many of you I'm sure know. Uh, so we wanted to explore whether or not this early effect translated into a lifetime effect. And uh, in this particular case, these animals are given the 5 and 20 percent. This is actually a portion of a larger study even than what I'm showing here. Uh, but in any case, the animals are given 5 percent uh, over the course of their lifetime, which is uh, basically about two years or so. Um, this is the level of tumor severity taken into consideration both the incidence and tumor weight. In contrast, the animals given 20 percent is that. I mean, that's striking. That is really striking. And, and in fact, you know, confirms, in fact, what the Indian workers, I think, had, had basically found. What was really interesting, too, though, was that these animals were all living at 100 weeks with no tumors. Very energetic, sleek hair coats, as if, in fact, they were still rather young animals. It was a remarkable difference. These animals, given uh, the good levels of protein, so to speak, exposed to the same level of carcinogen, were all dead with tumors at 100 weeks. So again, I didn't need a statistician <laughs> to tell me whether or not this was this is for real. Uh, but this, of course, we, it, I mean, this is a tiny, tiny snapshot of the various and sundry ways we looked at this particular relationship. But I think this explains fairly well what we were, what we were doing. And then it was that I started paying some attention to what was this kind of protein we were using. And it turns out the protein we were using is casein, which is the main protein of cow's milk. It's about 87% of total protein in cow's milk. I came from a dairy farm, by the way, milk and cows. And I started out my graduate work actually doing my doctoral dissertation uh, with the idea of promoting the use of this kind of protein. So for me, uh, it, it was a struggle uh, to, to sort of get my arms around that. But in any case, uh, soy protein and wheat protein, even when fed at the higher levels, did not do this. So here's a simple, I mean, it, it's, it's a limited comparison, of course. We've got one animal protein, in this case, two plant